Good evening, Mr. Bond fans. I may have had my misgivings about the John Gardner continuation novels so far, but one thing that I can absolutely not ding the man on is productivity. The year is 1989. He is releasing his ninth Bond book of that decade, and it's his second Bond release of that calendar year. There are times when it literally takes me weeks to build up the gumption to switch the washing machine on. How is this guy writing two books a year? Though the caveat here is, of course, that unlike Win, Lose, or Die, John Gardner as License to Kill is, of course, a novelization based on a screenplay written by Michael G. Wilson and Richard Maybaum. And remarkably, it was the first Bond novelization released in 10 years. I've covered the Christopher Wood novelizations on this channel in the past, and I really loved both of those, uh, particularly James Bond, The Spy Who Loved Me, but it curious to me that it took them 10 years since the release of James Bond and Moonraker to do another novelization. I guess it's because the Bond films of the 80s, all of the John Glenn directed ones, while they weren't straight up adaptations of individual works of Fleming, they did cherry pick enough from Fleming's works and obviously shared the title with some of his uh, short stories that they could still release a book and slap now a major motion picture on the title and kind of, you know, box ticked for the <laughs> marketing department. That being said, though, when it comes to films like Octopus Sea and A View to a Kill, yeah, sure, they're taking their title from an Ian Fleming short story, but there is so much original material in them, I'm surprised that they never bothered to do novelizations of those screenplays. License to Kill was, of course, the first Bond film to use a wholly original title. Ian Fleming never wrote a story and titled it License to Kill. So I guess from a marketing, merchandising standpoint, it makes sense to do a novelization so you can have that title on a bookshelf and people are gonna buy it. Getting the official Bond author of the day, John Gardner, to do it though presents some interesting continuity conundrums. Gardner's books so far have continued on with the continuity originally set by Ian Fleming, uh, but where it gets interesting is that License to Kill the screenplay adapts elements from Fleming's original works, uh, most notably Live and Let Die and the Hildebrand rarity. I mean, the whole catalyst for Bond's adventure in the film version of License to Kill is that his friend Felix Leiter is maimed by a shark, and that very same thing happens in Ian Fleming's Live and Let die. It was only the second Bond novel ever released. So in the book timeline since then, Felix Leiter has had artificial appendages, and Gardner obviously continued on this detail into his timeline. So the Felix Leiter of the John Gardner books does have an artificial leg and an artificial arm. So when it comes to adapting the screenplay of License to Kill to novel form to fit in with this continuity, John Gardner surely couldn't have Felix Leiter fed to a shark for a second time, could he? Oh dear reader, he could. As you would expect, License to Kill the novelization follows much the same plot as the film. It's Bond going up against a villainous drug baron named Fran Sanchez, and all the same main characters of that story are present here. There's Pam, Lupe, Dario, M, Moneypenny, and even Q himself appears in the novelization, which is um, really odd, as that character has just never been a major element of any of the novels, even from the Ian Fleming days. As such, though, I'm not going to be going through the plot beat by beat, because it's the same thing, broadly speaking, but I do want to cover some of the elements that maybe give a little extra context to things that we see in the film and aspects that stuck out to me while I was reading this. Chief amongst them being how far I feel like literary Bond has moved from Ian Fleming's creation. And I guess it's obvious that this would happen. I mean, we are nine books into John Gardner's tenure. It's only natural that some of the author's own sensibilities would take over and Bond would become something of a cipher for himself as he originally was for Ian Fleming. But nonetheless, he has started to feel like a different character for me, and I suppose it really stuck out for me with License to Kill in particular because you've got this really interesting thing where the Bond, the literary Bond, is more removed from Ian Fleming's original creation than the cinematic Bond of License to Kill. I think most people would agree that Dalton's version of the character in particular took on an awful lot of the original uh, feel of the Ian Fleming James Bond, and it was just kind of fascinating for me to, to like, particularly because I've done a deep dive into that film so recently, and so much of Dalton's performance in that that I admire, and elements of Fleming that you can just really feel in the, in the DNA of that film, and then to come to the to come to the book, <laughs> and the book 
feels less like the original author's work than the film version, even though it's, you know, it's, yeah, I just found it kind of interesting. There are so many small differences in reactions and observations that just make them feel like very different characters, the book and film versions. Like, it, this is an example. Um, in the film, as Bond is leaving Felix and Della's wedding party, there's that great tender moment where Bond is clearly thinking about his own dead wife, and it really brings home the melancholy of that situation for the character. In the book, he's more interested in a bit of skirt that he's seen at the wedding party, and he's like, you know, his monologue's going like, oh, that blonde, I bet she's a bit of a goer, isn't she? And then as Bond says goodbye to Felix and Della, he's, you know, hopping in the taxi with this, you know, pretty thing on his arm and it's just like oh this is different <laughs> incidentally a detail that i did find kind of interesting i wonder if this was in the screenplay at any point in the book uh mention is made of Della being originally a friend of Bond's, um, and I kind of like that detail actually. It explains why they're so chummy in, in the film. So there's just one more little detail that I want to mention um, to give you an example of just how a relatively small thing can just give you such a different impression of the character. At the moment where Bond meets Killifer for the first time in the film, he's clearly very unimpressed with the guy. At that same point in the story in the book, this is the passage, this is an exchange between Bond and Killifer. Some right, huh? A great job. Don't know how to thank you, James. Give the credit to Felix. Between the three of us, I'd rather have my name left out of this. He warmed to Killifer, mentally summing him up as one of those hard-working, dedicated, salt-of-the-earth agents, a fast-disappearing breed from most intelligence, security, and drug enforcement organizations. Again, such a small thing, but it, in the book it just ends up, because obviously Killifer ends up going on to, you know, betray Felix and whatnot, so in the book it just makes Bond seem like a really bad judge of character that he has had this very small exchange with Killifer and he's like, oh yeah, that guy, he's a salt of the earth kind of guy. I appreciate that the change in the book may have been to facilitate these, but surprise factor to be perfectly honest, like later on in the story when it is revealed that Killifer is actually a bad and it is more of a surprise in the book than it is in the film where we see his role in, Fran in Sanchez's um, escape. Um, in the movie, the suspense about whether or not he's going to help break Sanchez out is, revol is resolved so quickly, but I'm just not sure that in the book it paints Bond in the best of lights. Another element that I didn't think came through as well on the page as it does in the film is um, Sanchez himself. Robert Darvey is one of the very best Bond villains of all time, and I didn't feel that the novelization captured that same essence. On the page, the character came across a bit flat for me. And I think a part of that is that, for the most part, Gardner in the in the book tries to keep the narrative with Bond. So as where the film will cut to a, a scene where Bond, you know, Bond is not present, uh, chiefly being the, uh, the scene where Felix is fed to the shark and Sanchez is obviously there. All the information of that scene that we see play out in the film is conveyed through dialogue and Bond is there through a lot of it. It's not like a hard and fast rule, there are passages where Bond isn't there and we maybe follow Pam or, or whatever, but for the most part some bits have changed here and there so that we're learning information at the same time as Bond or he's got an earpiece, he's listening into Sanchez having a conversation with someone, which I don't think is a bad impulse for a novel at all. I think it makes absolute sense to try and keep the narrative with Bond rather than zipping back and forth constantly, but it just means that Sanchez doesn't have as many opportunities to truly make an impression like he does in the film. Anyway, while we're on the subject of the shark scene, um, let's talk about Felix, who is on his second marriage um, in the Gardner continuity, because of course previously established, uh, Felix has a family. He infamously pimps out his own daughter, Cedar, to Bond at the end of For Special Services, in a passage that continues to haunt me to this very day. And funnily enough, his daughter doesn't actually appear in this book. You, you would have thought that she would have had some kind of reaction to her father's marriage and maiming, but um, yeah, it's really curious what Gardner chooses to um, keep in continuity with this one. Anyway, yes indeed, in this continuity, Felix is fed to a shark for a second time. Um, here are some of my favourite passages explaining the, the unlikelihood of this scenario. And there's absolutely no subtlety about this at all. The chapter is actually called Lightning Sometimes Strikes Twice. So this is just at the point in the story where Bond is uh, coming into Felix's home and he's gonna find him um, after the shark attack. Not again! Bond heard his own voice and knew exactly what he meant. His near total recall of that terrible time in Miami when Felix lost half a leg and 
an arm to Mr. Big's shark, came scurrying like a pack of tarantulas into his head. This time, Felix had already lost his new bride, and Bond began to face the probability of his old friend being dead also. He followed the trail of blood up the stairs and experienced a number of horrifying sensations. Felix's gloved false hand on his own arm, the man's laugh, memories of a girl called Solitaire, and the sick message lighter's torturers had left. He disagreed with something that ate him. Strangest of all, his mouth and taste buds brought back the flavour of key lime pie which he had eaten during the wedding reception. Was it only yesterday? I feel like we really missed out on something by not having that detail in the movie. Oh, I knew I should have had that Pepto-Bismol. Bond gritted his teeth. The whole thing had a doom-laden sense of deja vu. Quickly, he unwrapped the sheet. The only question now was whether Felix was alive. What was left of his clothing was bloody and torn. The false limbs were gone, and with them a lot of flesh and some bone around the stump of his leg, together with jagged rips in the shoulder, to which he once fitted the artificial arm. I can only assume that Gardner had some ridiculous limitations put on him to have the gall to try to suggest that the same thing happens to the same character twice in a timeline. What makes it even more bizarre is that Gardner chooses to adapt it and just to have Felix's artificial limbs ripped off rather than anything else. I mean, fair enough, Felix is running out of limbs to lose at this point, but don't get me wrong, I'm sure that a shark ripping through even an artificial limb and ripping it off is going to be incredibly painful and, you know, could well result in death. It would be incredibly painful, but it does make his injuries seem somewhat lesser than, like, well, yeah, like in the film, where he does have half of his actual leg bitten off. Anyway, what makes this even more bizarre is that the loops that Gardner has to jump through to contrive that we, we, we will accept that Felix Leiter is once again attacked by a shark in much the same way as in a previous story, um, he does not apply anything like that to the presence of Milton Crest, who of course was a character from Ian Fleming's short story, The Bond Encountered, in the Hildebrand rarity. Again, I just assume that there were just limitations on what Gardner could and couldn't change, because I would have thought that the easiest thing to do would have just been to change the name of the pervy lech who owns the boat, but no, and Bond doesn't even comment on the unlikelihood of meeting a man, an awful man with a boat with the same name, uh, again. So it's just very strange what is what continuity is being observed with this and what isn't and what is choosing to be faithful to the film and what isn't. So, so, so these are some other additions and changes that stuck out to me. Um, M in the book seems much more uh, soft on the whole Bond going rogue thing. In the film, he's very hardline with this. You very much get the sense that it's Money, Penny and Q coming to Bond's aid off the book in the film. But in this version of the story, it seems like M is kind of the facilitator of them helping Bond out at all. Here's a part of the Money Penny M exchange uh, from the film in the, in the novel. Let me see that. He whipped up the paper and began to read aloud, his voice rising into mere fury as he read. US immigration has no reports of 007 leaving the United States as of 1500 hours today. By heaven, who authorized this? I'm afraid I did, sir. I thought you'd be worried about James. He's gone missing. M's voice softened. You know better than that, Money Penny. Much better. And it's you who's worried, isn't it? She bit her lip and nodded. Harumph. Well, think it through. You know what he'll be up to. On his way to get that blighter Sanchez. I'm afraid James has gone off the deep end and he has to be stopped. Or helped. He gave her a thin smile. Look, I've already alerted our man in Isthmus. He drew out a smaller piece of paper from under the pile he carried. Now, to put your mind at rest, I want this memo out now, this afternoon, understand? M turned and marched back into his office. Moneypenny smiled as she read the memo, then picked up the telephone. She said, get me Q branch, please. It's an interesting change, because it kind of changes a bit of the feeling of the sequence later on, where the ninjas and the man in Isthmus are coming to apprehend Bond. It makes that whole intervention seem less brutal, I guess, less cold. And don't get me wrong, it's not as if in the novelization the ninjas are already softer on Bond when they apprehend him. They're not going up and saying, ah, oh, how do you do? Would you care to be extradited to the UK again now? But it does nonetheless make that moment a bit less brutal because you know that, okay, M still does kind of care about Bond. I did really like that Gardner gives us an excuse for why Bond has that manta ray disguise once he's gone off grid. It's such an elaborate prop when it shows up in the film, but in 
novelization, it informs us that Bond and Sharky actually fashion that thing themselves out of a bit of tarp and bamboo that they find on Sharky's boat. The amount of time dedicated to this manta ray thing is quite surprising actually in the novelization. There's a whole title of the novelization called The Journey of the Manta. There's also quite a bit of detail added in towards the end of the story as to what Q gets up to while Bond and Pam are at the Olympia Tech facility. Q actually goes and alerts the authorities to what's going down in the climax and they all descend on the place. It's kind of cool seeing how Q could have been more involved in the climax, but the fact that Q, the novel version of Q, is in this story and this timeline, this continuity, it it does feel a bit off. Garner has been using Anne Riley, cute, as the main gadget giver of his tenure as Bond, but Major Boothroyd barely even appeared in Ian Fleming's stories, so he's certainly not as big a presence in any of the books as Moneypenny and M are. But hey, whatever, it would have felt really strange, I guess, if instead of Major Boothroyd it was Anne Riley who turned up um, on this mission. That, may, that would well turn the love triangle of Bond, Pam and Lupe into a love square, so it's an extra complication that I guess the novelization didn't want to deal with. One of the more bizarre changes from the film that really stuck out to me when reading this is that, okay, do you remember in the film Sanchez has this whole subplot with some stinger missiles? Well, that very same detail is included in this novelization, but Gardner clearly takes issue with the idea that Sanchez could ever be using stinger missiles in his evil schemes. This is from the exchange between uh, Bond and Pam where Bond first learns about the missiles. Uh, so this is Pam. Sanchez has managed to buy four handheld missiles from the Contras. He paid well over the odds for them. What kind of missiles? Stingers? Blowpipes? SA6s? SA8s? Chaparrals? I know they're not stingers. I heard him say stingers were no good because they were cumbersome. Difficult to cart around, what with the electronics pack and all. These are prototypes of some new thing. I don't know if they even have a proper designation. You know what they're doing, letting the Contras field test this new stuff for them. These things can be used in one of two modes, either ground to air or ground to ground. And then the fact that they are not stingers is mentioned uh, later on in the story as well. On it, there were four unmistakable shapes. He had been right. They were not stingers or even blowpipes. These little missiles were more the size of the old, now outmodded and unstable red eyes. Of all the things to change from the film, the, 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 the missiles would be like quite low on my list, uh, I would have thought, if I were to be novelizing this thing. I assume that this is Gardner flexing some of his own military tech knowledge, which is cool, and props to the guy, he clearly knows his stuff, but it feels like he's taking a dig at the film by spending a couple of passages on how, how the missiles couldn't possibly be stingers, and it does kind of beg the question that if he could have changed that plot detail, then why didn't he change some of the more intrusive issues, like, you know, Felix being maimed by a shark and the presence of Milton Crest. Despite all that, overall, I think that John Gardner's license to kill does it does exactly what it says on the tin. It is a straight up novelization of License to Kill, the 1989 movie. Like, it's fine. It works. I think the action sequences and some of the more gory details are well described throughout, but it's certainly not at the level of, I would say, the Christopher Wood novelizations. Ranking this with the other John Gardner books is kind of difficult because it does feel like its own thing. I guess I I guess I would put it on par with License Renewed. I mean, it does what it does. It passed the time for me on a few tube journeys. It was a, you know, diverting adventure to read along. So, yeah, okay, I guess I would put it just under License Renewed because obviously it, it is an adaptation of a screenplay and I think that the film is the much better way to experience this story. Moving forward, I'm going to be very interested to see if this is now built into the Gardner continuity or not. In this story, Bond is still a commander rather than a captain that he was promoted to in the previous Gardner book. So I'm curious to know if Gardner has just done away with that concept altogether and Bond just is a commander now for the rest of this timeline. Um, I guess we'll find out, but if there's one thing that I'm certain of, it's that I want Felix Leiter to be maimed by sharks in every single novel going forward. I want this to be like Kenny from South Park. Let me know your own thoughts on this novelization in the comments section below. Also below you can find links to my various social media pages as well as the subscribe button and the Mrs. Bell oh, notification Mr. button. Stay super up to date on future video uploads that I make on this channel. Please do click one or both of those buttons and with all that being said and until next time Bond fans, so long for now.